Thanks very much. So we've, uh, we've reached the next point, uh, the juncture, or that moment when we have a breakthrough, evolve and potentially move forward. Now, like all great transformations, it's not easy. A lot of organizations have challenges evolving. Most people here are probably trapped in some sort of system of work that they feel that they've no influence over, that they have no autonomy over, they probably even don't understand the purpose of it. And then the rest of these organizations wonder when there are these changes, where did it come from? Why didn't they see it? Why didn't we anticipate the future? So what I'm going to share with you today is my experience of being tired of that system of work, of being fed up of those organizations that try to change but don't really want to change, and show a new way, a new model about how you can drive continuous transformation in your organization. And this is what ExecCamp is about. Now the Fortune 500, they're most of my clients, and they are struggling. 57% of the Fortune 500 have disappeared over the last 20 years. That's a shocking statistic. What's even more shocking is the way that they actually think how they're going to survive. 49% actually have activities designed around cost reduction to grow. Now, this is one of the most antiquated ideas. When organizations focus on cost, cost actually goes up. When they focus on quality, costs go down. But this is the sort of issue. And yet only 27% of them have ideas about how they can grow their business by investing in new products and developments. So when you look at this behavior, these cultures, what does it tell you about these organizations? Are they defending? Are they exploring? Are they pushing themselves forward? Are they trying to protect what they've got? So this is sort of the dynamic of the industry that we're in and the types of organizations we're up against. The other question is, actually, what business are you in? I'm going to get really loud now. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that most people when you look at these organizations, you can only see what they're showing you. Most of the businesses that you point to or are wondering about how they're doing innovation are probably somewhere in the region of three to five cycles ahead of what they are showing you. And yet, we point to the examples of what they are showing us from what they did yesterday as the way forward, where they're cycles ahead. Netflix, great example. Started in the C CD shipping business. That's what they did. No, sorry, they didn't. They got into the idea of going to the cloud and distributing things virtually. Nope, sorry, no, they didn't. They got into the business of creating content that they could distribute to the cloud. Oh, no, sorry, they got into the business of not being a, taking the distributor rights as well. So now they know end to end from when they have an idea until it's in front of you on your machine and they distribute the rights for other people to buy their content. Just to give you an example, Apple make 30% of, of a lot of their profits on just distributing content through iTunes. And now the funny thing is, Netflix are starting to sell CDs to people again of their own content. How funny is that? But then I go in and I talk to executives and they're like, don't worry. Don't worry, we've got a plan. We're going to change. We're building an app. It's going to save our business. And then I have to tell them again, well, I'm sorry, apps are dead. Because people like Google just inject content straight into the search results now. You don't even need an app anymore. There's another sunk cost that's going to save your business that's going to fail. Yet this is the idea, right? This is what people think is change in their organization. And meanwhile, back at base, we're all in this little silo pod, locally optimized, little systems of work while the overall system suffers. Right up here at the back, this is like the dream. Everyone's trying to get here. If they get there, they get the hell out of the cubicle farm. 
And you wonder, how can collaboration happen in this space? But then there's a different challenge when you're a large multinational. Because every single idea you have, it's the same old song. It's too much, too little, too late. The lead time for business impact, as Dan North mentioned today, in large organizations is orders of magnitude different than what you would consider some of the smaller innovation companies. Even the bigger ones, they make the cost of experimentation so cheap that people can run multiple experiments and learn all the time. But if you're in a large multinational, it's too much. Every idea, $200 million. I've got an idea, $200 million to do anything. And if you're lucky, of all of that idea, you'll get half of what you expect for your $200 million, and in even worse than that, you'll probably get it in two years' time. And then you're wondering, when you have these ideas that cost so much that you get half of and take twice the amount to deliver, why they don't achieve the outcomes that you hope. Most organizations, if you're lucky, will have maybe two or three ideas that they invest in a year. And they might be lucky if they'll even deliver in that year. And this is the challenge that they have. But then they've also got cultural challenges about this. You go into every CEO brief briefing and we need to transform. We need to transform. What are they saying? Well, they're not saying that they need to transform. They mean all of you out there. The great unwashed. And this is fundamentally the bigger problem. So what I was looking at was ways to address these things. How can I get the people with the most influence in the organization to actually experience transformation? How can I dissolve the problem of too much, too big, too little, too late, and change the ability to experiment at speed? And that's why I created ExecCamp. And what I've done is take leading executives, and I mean from the CEO itself, to leave their organization for four to eight weeks with the goal of launching new businesses to disrupt their existing business. And I've done this with one of the largest airlines in the world. I've done it with one of the biggest banks in the world and also one of the largest airports in the world. This is happening. These people see the future and they want to influence it. Now, the benefits about doing this is you actually get executives out of their comfort zone. They start to get back in front of innovation again. Secondly, they start to learn by doing. Every executive has read every book you can think of about innovation. They know all the theory, yet that very few people have actually practiced it. What is it like to go through a learning cycle? The benefit then of when they do this is they actually come back to the organization and become coaches for people in the organization to have experiences like they've experienced. They understand how to create systems of work to allow innovation to happen. They also get to test numbers of ideas, hundreds of ideas. See, the interesting thing about innovation is it's not how many good ideas that you find, it's how many bad ideas you discount quickly is the measure of progress. And finally, when they step out of the organization for a while, it actually creates a safe-to-fail experiment for the next generation of leaders to take the leadership of the organization for a short period of time and experience what it's like to run large multinationals. Sound interesting? How does it work? Well, most of the time when I tell people about this, especially executives, this is what happens. What are you talking about? That can't be possible. So to make people feel better, I made a nice diagram that wiggles and goes up to the right, so everything's going to be OK. But I get people thinking about there is method these things. You need to prepare them. You need to help them understand there is a plan. You need to get people to immerse themselves in a different environment, ideate as much as possible, and then innovate. Test the ideas as quickly as possible to find out what doesn't work and then have impact by those leaders bringing that information back into their organization and championing it through. 
then you can start to scale these ideas because what I do is I use a method of see one, do one, teach one. So the executives actually see how these things happen the first time. Then they get to lead one, and I help coach them. And then finally, they become coaches for other people leading this. So you've a repeatable, scalable model. So this leads us to the exec camp mantra, which is big, think big, learn fast, and start now. Thinking big. Your new mobile app is not thinking big. One of the largest airlines companies in the world had an executive mandate. The sponsor of this was the CEO of the actual organization. They understand that if you are going to drive change in your organization, they need to be the person to support it. Not to do it, to support it. So what we did is get a $20 billion organization to get their executives to leave the company for eight weeks with the goal of trying to launch a new business to disrupt their entire business. Pretty uh, big, if you're asking people to think like that. Who thinks that their organization would allow that to happen? No hands. You're all behind already. So when you build these types of teams, you don't have time to mess around. You have to hit the ground and be performant from the start. So we took loads of measures about how you could reduce the uncertainty of not achieving high performance from day one from the start. We started to look at building cross-functional teams from the start. People understanding the different skills, abilities, capabilities that we would need in the organization in order for us to be performant. And we all needed to know that about one another. So how do you do that? How do you create a, a culture where you can trust one another? For anyone who's read about the Google uh, Aristotle project about creating high-performance teams, the number one thing you have to do is create psychological safety. So I'm afraid to put my ideas out there and you won't like, banish me because my ideas are bad, we'll challenge the idea. You're safe in that environment. We did things like Lunar Spark, where we got people to understand their biases. Who's a big thinker? Who's detail-oriented? Why would they struggle to collaborate with one another quickly when someone wants to go into the detail and someone wants to talk about the big picture? So you start to actually build empathy for one another, but also understand the strengths of the theme and where you have gaps and how you can start to manage them, which means you can start to collaborate in a much more effective and timely manner. But to achieve great product delivery, there's a number of aspects that you need to take into account. The first is ideas. But ideas are really cheap. The thing you have to actually optimize for is discounting them as quickly as possible. If someone has an idea, great. What's the quickest, smallest thing we can do to test it to see if it's true or invalidate it and move on? In organizations, if you're doing that three times a year at the cost of $200 million or an idea, 200 people to do it, and two years to deliver it, what do you think your chances are of getting that right the first time? What about the second time? What about the third time? Test hundreds of ideas then you'll get some good ideas. Demand. Doesn't, the most important thing about a product when you build it is not how beautiful it is, it's not how much it costs, it's not how quick it was to deliver. It's actually, will anyone use it? You need to find out as quickly as possible by getting your ideas into the hands of your customers, do they find it usable or not? Tactics we'd use like that are show as we go on in the talk. But every time we had an idea, it's how quickly can we test it and who's the right customer we need to test this with. Building the ability of the team then to understand the strengths and weaknesses starts to enhance the way you can collaborate and then drive those ideas forward. Who's going to champion that idea? Who's got the best context and abilities to drive it forward? And then finally, execution. How can we reduce the lead time to finding out information? How quickly can we find out if this is a good, bad, or a different idea, and we need to do something else? Every experiment is an investment in information. It's actually an economic decision. If you're making a multi-million dollar bet, you want to invest a relative portion to that idea to reduce the uncertainty of that number. So when you start to do these types of projects, it's actually about setting up goals. How do you run a good experiment? What's the first thing you have to do? 
Pardon? Hypothesis. hypothesis, yeah. How do you create a hypothesis? You make some observations. Right? You understand, well, actually, what do you want to learn? You observe the world, you formulate a hypothesis, and the, which is a theory, and then you need to uh, formulate a way to exercise that hypothesis to invalidate it or validate it. And also, before you do that, you need to define a measure of success, an indicator that will tell you if we're moving in the right direction or wrong. And then you run the experiment. So when you start to think about these programs, defining transformational targets or goals that you want to shoot for before you start is really important. So we would sit down with the team and ask them, what is truly transformational for this idea? Like good techniques you use there is like the thinking of like zero to 100% to set boundaries. Zero percent of our customers are going to interact with us in a manual way. What would it take to do that? 100 percent of our customers are going to have their problem solved the first time that they call us. What would it take to do that? It's an interesting way to push your mind forward and get out of the day-to-day -day because people just want to come up with point solutions. And this gives you an idea about starting to create interesting ways about outcomes that you want to achieve. Not, I want to build a mobile app, I want to change the way we interact with our customers. Much more powerful. So what we do is then take people out of their daily and daily environment so they actually get to experience a totally different way of working. We take them out to see a different whole ecosystem of people that they could work with. Spend time with VCs, spend time with thought leaders and education people, spend time with startups. So they can actually be inspired by some of the methods and techniques that they're using. Not that they want to become a startup, that they want to use some of the behaviors and tactics and strategies that they use to get information quickly. It also provides them an opportunity to build relationships and partnerships. When you're trying to do innovation, you can't do everything best in class in every aspect of it. You need to partner with people. So what we would do is start to introduce them to all these different types of companies. So say you're in the travel business, you'd probably be interested in what some of these companies are doing up here. They're probably interested when you're a $20 billion organization about how they could work with you. You actually have trusted partners that you can start to work with. Flyer is a really great example. Does anyone know what Flyer does? It tells you when to buy a ticket. Any ticket. Say the next time I want to fly from London to San Francisco. I just punch it in, give it a date range, and it'll tell me the exact day to buy that ticket at its cheapest price. That removes all the liquidity from the airline. They've just become a commodity, like that. The machine knows more and better when the price is going to drop than the humans who actually drive the economics for the business. That's pretty scary. So what do you want to do? Make friends with that person or have them as an enemy? And what I, I give them when they go out there is these cards, right? People are in a very generative space. They're meeting loads of people, you're discussing ideas, you're debating things. So what I do is give them these cards that they can quickly, as they're sitting down there, just start to sketch out ideas, because you're inspired. You're hearing constantly different information from different domains, different ways of thinking. How can I apply that in my business? How can you capture those ideas quickly, at speed? So at the end of one day, this is how many ideas you end up with. And then you can bring them back and you start to sort them. Increase the transparency about what's going on. Put these up in your entire organization. This wall, anyone who had the idea, they just stick it up. It's in the main hallway of the organization. You can actually see what people are thinking about. They prioritize some of the ideas, which they need to get more information on, which they're going to test how far much they're testing, what they're learning. Anyone in the organization can see this happening and contribute to it. Build accountability, ownership, and engagement. Most people, when they try to stick up a post-it note, they're told that facilities don't let them do it. This is the company's future on the wall. And what's interesting about it is these companies understand that the capability is not the idea. It's how much they're learning, how fast they are learning. That's the muscle they're developing. 
That's why Elon Musk laughs at people and publishes all the content about how to build any car you want in a public domain. Because they know, they've already learned four or five cycles as soon as they've published that. Toyota used to invite GM into their buildings to copy and take photographs of everything that was happening. Because they know, two days later, the system of work will have changed again. Take as many photos as you want. Huh? Copy it, yeah, sure. That's what's happening. Because they're learning fast. And when you learn fast in an information age, whoever has the most knowledge wins. So how fast are you learning? On a scale of one to five, with five being the fastest you could possibly learn, and one being the slowest you could possibly learn, let's all throw and see how fast we think we're learning in our organizations. Ready? One, two, three. Hold your hands up so you can all see. Yeah, say I. I think twos and threes, let's say. Don Reinerson, Principles of Product Development Flow. Required reading for everybody on this planet. 50% of time is spent at the fuzzy front end. The fuzzy front end is that time where executives sit around in a boardroom, have a bit of a chat on the golf course, make sure that you've got that 700-page PowerPoint deck done for me, come and pitch it to me, I'll give you some feedback that you need to go from 700 to 800 pages because it's not resilient enough, didn't like the numbers, have another meeting, get another golf round in. Now we need to talk about the budget. That only happens once every quarter. Then I'm going to pitch at the quarter. That didn't work. Now I'm going to have to wait for next quarter. What's happened in the rest of the world? They've moved forward. So you actually need to stop writing, and you need to start learning. So what I do is get the executives in a cross-functional team, understanding their capabilities and skills, and learning together at speed sharing the information and the knowledge that they have with one another and building upon it. Giving them simple models that they can communicate their ideas. This is the business model canvas by Alexander Osterwalder. A very simple way that you can map out a business model in three seconds. And the thing about this is, they know the first time they map out, it's wrong. They actually optimize for it being wrong. Because what you do is get an expression, a hypothesis, and then you start to test it and refine it. And that's where you get resiliency. Not investing all your time in trying to get the hypothesis correct. It's testing. It's what matters. And then you can quickly map out these business hypotheses and start to test at speed. And this is what uh, I affectionately know or call hypothesis-driven development. Actually seeing everything that you run or phrasing all your ideas as experiments or outcomes that you actually want to achieve. And this just isn't in the context of products. This is in the context of products, process changes, tools that you might select. We believe by having a cross-functional team will result in higher collaboration across the team. We'll know we have confidence that this is working when seven out of the ten people in the team say, we're collaborating better. That's an experiment. We'll know this is true when we run it for a week. Product experiments, think of any. When you start to phrase these things in experiments, you actually build more resiliency into the way you're thinking about these ideas. What does success look like? How could we get there? much more interesting way to view the world, because they're target conditions that you are shooting for. So what does that start to look like in the teams? Well, I build these small little canvases for them, that they create like little expressions of their idea, who they're for, what's the little journey that will happen, what could be some of the tech that they might need, what would be some of these idea cards turn into canvases. They get waiting mechanisms, they're collaborating with them, they're challenging each other about what works and what doesn't. They're starting to use the Socratic process of back and forth that a cross-functional team offers to start to build resiliency into the idea, prioritize the things that they want to learn, and then start to test them with the people that matter most. So when Eric Ries wrote uh, the Lean Startup and made lots and lots of money, 
The idea is not, what's this amazing measure we need to come up with? What's the thing that we want to learn? What's the thing we're going to build? It's actually, how fast can we go through a learning cycle? What's the smallest possible investment we can make to actually give the most amount of information that we can learn the most important things? And that was the idea behind what minimum viable products are. It's not to create a small version of a product. It's actually to reduce or exercise your business hypotheses as quickly as possible, to reduce the uncertainty of building the wrong thing. But sadly, this is one of the most poorly understood and most ambiguous terms in our industry. Who calls the minimum viable product the first release of their product? How long? Yeah. And take six months, $100 million, and 300 people to build. That's not an experiment. Well, it is, but it's an expensive one. And this is why I talk to the execs about getting out of the building. When you have these ideas, you have to go and talk to the people who they are designed for, not the idea of who you think is going to like them. This is an extremely expensive experiment. It costs 10p to print the piece of paper, and this extremely complicated example of an iPhone is a piece of cardboard stuck between two bits of laminate. Total cost $4, and that's how you use it. You can start to experience what it's like to use this application for the grand total of $5 and get feedback on what ideas and what don't. And you can put them then in front of the people that matter most, customers. Now, what's the hardest thing for an executive when you're used to uh, doling out ideas? Pardon? Listening? Yes? What else? Normally, they're used to have these things everywhere. Do, do, do. Did everyone get a hippo when they came in? So there's a great culture hack by a guy called Rani Kovaki who set up the experimentation platform for Amazon and also then later for Bing. And he used to give people hippos. When the executives came up with great ideas that they thought we should do because they're the highest paid person's opinion. So when they came up with a great idea and were like, this is going to save the business. We only have three ideas a year we can do, remember? Most of them have to be the executive's favorite idea. Randy would go up to him and go, that's very nice, here you go, here's a hippo for you. Now let's go and test some real ideas. And this is really tough, right? Like uh, one of the times when I was doing this at one of the CEOs of, the, of uh, one of the companies, literally sits down, I'm like, okay, you've got this idea, yeah, it's brilliant, it's going to save the business, I've just never been able to get it through the funding process. Okay, great. What is it? Uh, it's the idea is to another food uh, photo-taking app. That's the idea. Brilliant. Let's go test it with a customer. What? Let's go test it with a customer. Uh, OK. So I sit him down, much like we see here. I asked him to draw an example of what the product does and show it to a customer. The customer is like, I have no idea what this thing does. What's the executive's response? You can guess. Is the idea the problem? Is the customer the problem? <laughs> Who's this customer? That's not the customer I deal with. Get rid of them. Get me another customer in here. Same scenario again. Sit down. Show the picture. Ask the customer to use it. Customer says, I've no idea what this thing does. What's the executive's response? Get me another customer. So, seven million customers later, no, I'm only joking. The only way you can break people's mental models of the world is they have to experience something. You need to create an experiment where people experience feedback from people to say, I don't understand this idea. We need to do something different. And the testament to that executive that they actually became, they had the breakthrough they realized that the ideas weren't about them, it was about the idea. And that customers actually were the best people to give them feedback on whether that was a good idea or not. They actually became the best proponent of this because they realized that to succeed, it was about learning. And they wanted to learn fast. 
And they started to see not only the product ideas that they had, but even the ideas they had for their organization as a hypothesis. And the people that they would test those ideas with would be, for organizational ideas, employees. What do you think about this process? What do you think about this performance management uh, exercise that we're doing? What do you think the way that we have incentives set up in your organization? Biggest transformation were the people themselves. So this is why it's important to stop talking, well, obviously not when you're doing a presentation, but actually start testing stuff. And getting people out in front of the customers, the real people that are going to use it all the time. Again, another super expensive ex experiment. This is an iPhone with a peg, a rubber band, and a USB camera recording somebody using the application in a coffee shop. Total cost of experiment, $15. That includes the coffee as well, the coffee shop. And then start putting the ideas of what you're learning back up there. Green, it's worked. Red, uh, amber, not understood. Red, we need to do something totally different. And then constantly evolving your ideas and just distribute them to other people to give feedback and keep learning. Even got to the stage that the teams were actually setting up devices in their areas where anyone walking around the whole company could actually go up to screens that they set up facing uh, out externally to the team, where you could actually use the next version of their product and give them feedback on it. They had a feedback box with these green and red uh, uh, cards that you could just write your, uh, what worked, what you didn't understand. At the end of the iteration, teams take the boxes, dump them out, sort through the ideas, loads of feedback anonymously, people not afraid to share what they really think. Getting everybody sketching is one of the most important things that you can do when you start to talk about ideas. First thing when you tell an executive to draw a picture of an idea, they say, I don't know how to draw. And then you go, that's great, you're going to learn. The, idea, the point is not to draw a perfect drawing. The point is to express your hypothesis in a way that other people can potentially understand, debate, and engage on. When you get everybody starting to sketch, it actually creates a really generative environment where everyone is sharing their mental models of how things could work, how you could be better. You pull all those together, and you start to get even more different concoctions and mixes of those things. And then keep putting them back in front of your customers. Every week, we would do come up with an idea on a Monday, draw it on a Tuesday, test it on a Wednesday, refine it on a Thursday, test it on a Friday. Learning cycles as quickly as possible so people can actually understand what's working and what's not. You start tearing through ideas, hundreds of them, all the time building the resiliency of the idea, but learning exponentially over four to eight weeks. It's frightening. And this is the challenge I'm laying down to you. Three of the world's largest organizations are doing this. You can't sit around. You've got to start now. Because great leaders actually set unreasonable expectations of individuals. Elon uh, is known to be uh, unreasonable about the vision that he wants to go to Mars. The prime purpose of SpaceX is to get people to live on another planet, namely Mars. So every time they make a decision, what do you think is the first question that they ask? Will this get us to Mars quicker? So whether you're going out to buy a box of Post-its or you're going to have a company dinner with your friends, the first question is, will this get us to Mars faster? Will it help us achieve the mission that we're shooting for? And what are the type of experiments we can start to run to find out if we're getting there? And this is the important thing about when you start to run experiments. You need to create, initially, safe-to-fail ideas. Put your cross-functional teams together. Have a big vision. But think about the first small steps that you can do to get there. Testing that with the people that matter most, your customers, enables you to make an evidence-based decision based on their feedback about whether something worked, you should do something different or move on. Now, the challenge about an environment where you put people in a room together for a long period of time is everybody starts to fall in love with the ideas. It's only a matter of time. 
So what you constantly have to do is start challenging your thinking. So what we would do is three times a week, we would either invite in another startup, we would invite in a thought leader, a venture capitalist, a business leader, to challenge the ideas. Every idea we would stand up to build more resiliency, to get feedback about what this would work, to turn ideas to make them bulletproof, not have bullet holes in them. And this is the thing, again, about people being afraid to share the idea. When you're in an organization that you're locking yourself away, not only from your customers, but the people that can help you bring it to life, you have no opportunity to grow that. Another thing that was counterintuitive about doing this is actually the funding model. So normally, when you're in a large organization, because it's so painful to go through your budgeting and planning process, what do people do? When it was so hard to release software, what did we do? Well, we batched it up into a huge big process because it was easier to do one release every six months with all these changes in it rather than try and release things frequently in smaller batches based on outcomes. And then we came up with the concept of continuous delivery where we said we're going to deploy every change that we make into production and people said you're mad. And now we do it. If you don't do it, you're crazy. And yet, in the business world, we batch up our planning processes to do them annually, once every year, one release a year, where we say all the things that we're going to do, all the things that we're going to deliver, how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to take. You need to break your funding cycles down into smaller iterations, too. And this is where the economics come into play. You're paying for information. Relative to the upside, how much do I want to invest to reduce the uncertainty of building the wrong thing? And then use the smaller investment horizons to hold yourself accountable to outcomes. If we're going to build a rocket ship to the moon, what would we need to be doing in one month's time to prove or give us a sense that we're going in the right direction. What's the smallest, fastest possible thing we can do to achieve that, to work towards that? And then when we come together in a month's time, after we've defined that, let's hold ourselves accountable to those initial success criteria and use that to give us a sense of should we keep going, should we stop, or should we invest in another idea? If you don't design your governance process, your funding process, to account for decisions based on evidence or outcomes over short cycles, you're dead. When you're working in an area of high complexity and uncertainty, which innovation is about, you have no data, you have to favor shorter, faster learning cycles. Otherwise, you'll be making million-dollar investments in ideas and wasting money and time on things that nobody's ever going to use. And you'll only find out when it's too late. So when we came up with any ideas, and this is what I would encourage you to think about when you're back in your organization, these are the three steps that we use for all of them. When you have a big vision, think about an immediate proof point. What's the smallest possible thing? What's the, what do we expect to learn? And who's our target that we're going to test it against as quickly as possible? When you run that experiment, how quickly, what's the speed that you can actually get information to build upon it? And then think about how you would scale out the next set of experiments you would run over the next six months to bring that idea, not to life, but to reduce the next most uncertain part of it thinking about your customer's technology and the commerce about how it pulls together. Because we're in a world now where PowerPoint decks are useless. Nobody reads them. They go to SharePoint to die. Maybe if you're forward-thinking, you put it in GitHub to let it die there. This is what the new world looks like. It's a living, breathing artifact. 
that changes as frequently as the new information comes to light and you adapt to it. You outline your aspirational vision at the top. What's our moonshot? What's going to take us to Mars? How do we break that down into a set of customer hypotheses that we're going to test? What are the examples that we're going to use to exercise our beliefs? Then we have sets of experiments that we're going to run. And you can even see from this picture the fidelity of these that could be are actually working code right through to somebody just had an idea in the back of a napkin. So you actually have design experiments constantly running to exercise your customer hypotheses, turning them into a story map of what you're actually going to build and release, and what data will tell you if you've actually achieved these things before you go. Now, when you're working in a multi-million dollar organization, who's able to run an experiment on their own right now? If you wanted to run one person, two people, or maybe three? When you have executives doing this, they start to understand the benefits about making it economic and easy to experiment at speed, to help people learn what they want to do. For them, what we were able to do was launch a new product inside six weeks. That's the fastest they've ever brought anything to life in their entire history of the organization. They created a discounted ride-sharing service. So if the three of us were going on a trip from London to Madrid, all we had to do was email in our ticket numbers, and we all get a 10% discount on the flight. How do you think we started that project? Imagine you're in a multi-million dollar organization. How hard would it be to do that? What's the first thing you do? Well, you don't automate it. You don't build code. You test a system of work. So what we did, well, the group of us had to travel between London and Madrid. So we all booked our tickets. We rang up someone in the back office, told them all our, our numbers, and they manually pinned them together, gave us a 10% discount, and we did the trip. Let's reduce the uncertainty of the business hypothesis working first. If not written any code, we can still adapt. The quickest way to run the experiment is not to build code. Because only when you start to see that something actually works, then it's worth automating. Because if you automate from the start, you're removing yourself away from the friction of the actual transaction. What's the first thing people do when they have a great idea in a technology organization? They build a mobile app. Correct. That's my challenge to you. Next time you have a great idea, try not to build a mobile app. Try to see if you can manually serve that and understand how it works, and then understand where you should automate. Because as you quickly understand where the process has friction and where it doesn't, you can automate the repeatable components and stay close to the customer to learn on the friction. As a result of doing that, they uncovered all the obstacles in the system of work much quicker than if they tried to just build the entire process and discover them as they were building. You understand which you can automate and which you don't. Next thing you know, you have a multi-million dollar new product on the market, and you're beating your competition in six weeks. So, conclusions. Well, I'll, obviously everybody needs to go and do an exec camp, right? And this is what's really important. It's getting people, especially the executive team, back on the front line of innovation spending four to eight weeks actually doing this stuff so they understand how it works. Learning by doing, not reading theory and then exposing it and say, yeah, we're doing agile, yeah, we're doing continuous delivery, yeah, we're doing customer development. No, you're not. Get them to experience it. So then they become coaches for people in the organization and they can help others propel there. Test numbers of ideas, but also give the next generation of leaders a safe-to-fail experiment to run the company. These are the testimonials of the people that have done this program. You can read them. 
develop winning ideas at pace, influence stakeholders across the entire organization to do things differently. Agile and lean methodologies actually can't, don't work in startups, they work in large companies too. Here's a game-changing program, and the first test taste steps are proof points. You can see that it's actually working. Transformational for people involved in this program, and transformational for the business to move forward. So when you go back to your organization, tell these people, it's not even a case of, can I run an experiment? There's already multi-billion dollar organizations that are running these programs to change the way that they operate. A radical different approach. Because a year from today, you'll wish you started today. And go back and tell your CEO they're already behind, because people have already started. Don't forget the right session. I've been Barry O'Reilly. Thank you very much. Okay, I think I have five minutes for questions or so. I don't have the app, so I can't see them. Any questions? Yeah, great. So the question was, uh, most companies adopt Scrum-type methodology, and then this is a new methodology. Does that mean I have to throw everything away? Um, I guess uh, the way I think about these things is um, a methodology is just a set of practices that people pull together that sort of help them deliver, right? Uh, which is great. Right? But they're all tools. And they're really the most important tool, I would say, is this idea of continuous improvement, like retrospectives, where you're constantly asking yourself, you know, is this thing working for us or is it not? Could we come up with an experiment to try something different? and see if that helps us more or less. So, you know, often what I find with a lot of high-performing teams is they, they adopt a methodology maybe to start, but if you go back and see them in a year's time, the ones that are still fighting over, well, the, the book says we need to stand up and take orders every morning at nine o'clock, versus the teams that have just, you don't even, you can't describe what their methodology is because it's just a way of working. You know, uh, because they've experimented their way to a process optimized for their problems, that the way that they work and works for them, and they're invariably much better as a team because they're constantly learning new ways of working and optimizing and improving. And I think Toyota is probably really famous for this. Is like the example I said, the Americans would come in and take photographs of all the things that they were doing, and try and codify what they were doing that day into a methodology replicate the methodology, but not replicate the results, where Toyota were already seven cycles ahead in a different process. Uh, and the most famous story of that is the Andon cord. Did you ever hear of that? The Andon cord? So in Toyota, they have this thing called the Andon cord, which is, um, if anyone ever experiences an issue on the production line, they, they pull this cord and it stops the line, and the manager comes over to the worker and they have a debate and say, What's the obstacle? Can we come up with an experiment and try something? So anyway, when the Americans took all the photographs, the Andon cord was in all the photographs, so they put it in the factories. Right, but none, none of the Americans actually knew what the cord was for, so it was just hanging there, and they just feel like, working away. You know, and I think we see some of those problems in people just math blindly adopting methodologies. Okay, uh, maybe, maybe one more question, or? Oh, am I safe? Okay, uh, cool. I'll be around, stick around for the next half hour or so. And um, yeah, nice to meet everybody. Thanks very much.